I'm Dr. Austin Perlmutter, and have you ever wondered whether your muscle health relates to your brain health? The research is now showing us that what happens in our muscles doesn't just stay in our muscles, that having healthy muscles, and that means, yes, things like weightlifting, can actually have a significant impact on the quality of what is happening in our brains. In this video, we're going to break down the connections between muscular health and brain health. We'll talk about some of the best studied pathways that link what happens in our muscles with what is happening up here in our brains. And we'll talk about some of the best studied strategies and protocols that can help you to improve your brain health by way of your muscle health. If you're interested in brain science and neuroscience and understanding how to optimize your brain function, make sure you're subscribed to my channel, check out my other videos. I'm all about finding ways to give you the tools, the tips you need to optimize your brain health today and for the rest of your life. So with this said, let's jump into the topic of the day, how muscle health influences brain health. And by the end of this video, we will get to both the science and some practical steps that you can take to begin to incorporate into your day to optimize your muscle health and in doing so, improve your brain health. But I guess to start with, let's think about what is muscle. So each of us has multiple forms of muscle in our bodies, and we have three major types of muscle. The first type is skeletal muscle. The second type is cardiac muscle, muscle we find in the heart. And the third type is smooth muscle. Now, smooth muscle is involuntary, meaning we don't really have as much conscious control over whether it's going to be in use. Skeletal muscle here is the most important type of muscle as it relates to the connection between muscle health and brain health. And skeletal muscle makes up around 40% of our total muscle mass. It also is the makeup of our largest muscle groups. So our gluteus maximus, which is actually the largest muscle, the quadriceps muscle, the latissimus dorsi, which are back muscles. All of these muscles are made up of skeletal muscle. So with all this muscle in our bodies, and we see muscle on ourselves, we see muscle in other people, how is this actually linking to what is within our brains? And again, this kind of changes the entire paradigm of thinking about brain health, because for so long, we've thought about the brain is something that is isolated from the rest of the body. And yes, it is a couple of pounds that are inside of a skull protected by the blood brain barrier. But we now know very clearly that what is happening in our bodies is influencing our brains and muscle to brain communication is absolutely no exception to that rule. So our brains and our muscles are connected through a number of different molecular pathways. These include our blood vessels, obviously that's actually the conduit by which data can get from our muscles to our brains. But some of the mechanisms that really relate to what is happening within our brains, which is what we're going to focus on in this video, include the immune system and how muscles influence the immune system, our metabolism, which is kind of the sum total of how our bodies utilize nutrients, break down those nutrients and fuel our cells, as well as neurotrophins. And neurotrophins, basically molecules that go to the brain, these include molecules like brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF. So we're gonna be talking about each of these pathways in detail and I think you'll realize by the end of this video that the science is clear. What happens in our bodies influences our brain and what happens in our muscles in particular, when it's done in the right way, can have a dramatic, significant effect on our brain health. So let's start with the neuroimmune connection. How does what happens in our uh, muscles influence the immune system within the brain? For a moment of background here, your brain is about 15% of those cells are immune cells. They're called microglial cells. And again, there was this misconception that we now know is quite wrong, that the immune system of the body was not linked to the immune system of the brain and that the brain didn't really have an immune system. Again, 15% of your brain cells are bona fide immune cells. And the rest of the cells in your brain play a huge role in both receiving and sending out immune data. Why this matters is because the immune state of the brain plays a major role in our brain health. So not just in disease states, for example, autoimmune diseases like lupus or multiple sclerosis, but also chronic inflammatory diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, as well as now we understand mental health conditions like depression, all linked to the brain's immune state. 
Let's come back to the central question though, which is how does what happens in our muscles influence what happens in our brains? And in particular, how does it influence the brain's immune system? Well, here we're talking about molecules called myokines. Molecules are, myokines are small molecules. They're cytokines or peptides. They're made by muscle fibers when we exercise our muscles. And there are a number of different myokines, but the best example is probably one called interleukin-6. Now, there are a number of interleukins, but interleukin-6 is so interesting because it is known as the inflammatory cytokine, one of the most important cytokines that increases inflammation in the body and that measures inflammation in the body. So what I'm saying here is that muscle produces high levels of interleukin-6 and that that actually is a good thing for our bodies and our brains. That doesn't seem to make sense. But what the research shows is that the interleukin-6 produced by our muscles actually has an anti-inflammatory effect on our bodies and may have an anti-inflammatory effect on our brains. The reasons for this are a little bit complicated. It may have to do with different signaling pathways. There are different ways that interleukin can uh, signal and bind to receptors. It may also have to do with something called hormesis, which is the idea that a stressor in our bodies can actually in aggregate decrease stress on our bodies, meaning you may have an increase in a breakdown of muscles producing some inflammation, which leads the body to create a anti-inflammatory response. And the aggregate benefit is actually anti-inflammation. So there are a number of different myokines that can have immune active effects in our bodies and in our brains. And when we do that, well, we're actually getting a net benefit. Beyond myokines, we know that exercise, exercises that leverage our muscle use are going to have a net benefit to our immune state. We see that people who exercise at a moderate level and really key here to understand moderate because high levels of intense exercise may actually suppress immunity and increase inflammation. But moderate levels of exercise seem to decrease risk for getting infections and moderate levels of exercise can actually target and enhance our immune system by way of the metabolic effects. So we're gonna talk about that next, the metabolic effects of exercise specifically through muscles. But the core take home here is to understand that muscles can release molecules called myokines, and that in aggregate, these molecules may actually have a beneficial effect on our brains by way of neuroimmune connection. The next thing we're going to talk about is the metabolic connection with brain health that links to muscles. So metabolism, as I mentioned, is the sum total of the reactions that allow us to take uh, food, nutrients, break them down into energy, process them, and then get rid of the waste. We know that the majority of people living today have at least one marker of poor metabolic health. And that is important because poor metabolic health correlates with risk for dying early, cardiovascular disease. It's related to type 2 diabetes. It's related to risk for depression and Alzheimer's disease. When we think about the brain and metabolism, the brain is only about two to three pounds, but it uses up around 20% of our body's energy, meaning it sucks up a ton of glucose from the bloodstream. This does not mean that the brain works better when it has access to more glucose, because in the case of people who have very high levels of blood glucose, these tend to be people with diabetes, uh, something called diabetic ketoacidosis. There are actually a number of problems with the way the brain functions. What the brain needs is consistent access to fuel. It needs to be perpetually getting uh, access to glucose from the bloodstream. If glucose goes too low, if glucose goes too high, that is a liability. And importantly, if glucose levels are too variable, that has also been correlated with worse brain health. So what is physical activity? What does using our muscles do for our metabolism? And how does that relate to brain health? Well, when we exert ourselves, when we uh, use our muscles, we use up ATP and we have to pull in new glucose from our bloodstream. That helps to explain why physical activity can reduce glucose levels to a healthier place. This isn't necessarily meaning that you're going to crash your glucose if you do some weightlifting. What it means is you could actually bring down glucose if it's too high and help to regulate glucose because the other piece of this is 
that when we exercise, when we use our muscles, we improve insulin sensitivity throughout our bodies, which makes it easier for our bodies to process and stabilize blood sugar levels. And over time, these are things that are linked to better brain health. One other thing I'll say here, coming back to the conversation about these myokines, is that there are other myokines, and one example would be irisin. Irisin is released during physical activity, and it seems like when we compare aerobic activity to resistance training, something like weightlifting, that irisin may be higher as far as how much is produced when we lift weights, when we move our muscles in that way. Now, irisin may have a number of different benefits and effects on our body. But one of those effects seems to be that it helps to improve the conversion of what is called white fat, which is generally speaking more of a pro-inflammatory uh, metabolic disrupting form of fat to beige fat. So that has a number of implications. Beyond this, irisin may get into the brain where it may positively uh, augment brain metabolism. Core bullet here to remember is that when we mobilize our muscles, when we use our muscles, we are actually enhancing our metabolism uh, as far as regulating metabolic state throughout our bodies, and this may improve metabolic state in our brains. And there's one very interesting study that showed that when they took people and had them exercise more, there was evidence for improvements in insulin sensitivity in the brain, suggesting that the very act of exercising can improve the way that our brains use fuel. Very important stuff. Again, brain metabolism seems to be improved by using our muscles. The last uh, kind of bucket I wanted to talk about is that exercise, and in particular, using our muscles, seems to enhance a process called neuroplasticity. Now, neuroplasticity is the idea that our brains change dynamically each moment of each day in response to our environment, and issues with neuroplasticity have been linked to Alzheimer's, to depression, to a host of other brain-related issues. We want healthy neuroplasticity. Exercise may be the single most important upregulator of neuroplasticity that we know of. Why is this the case? Well, exercise helps to enhance blood flow to the brain. So the brain is getting enough nutrients and oxygen that it can form new connections between neurons. But the core of this seems to be really the metabolism, the immune, and then the neurotrophic benefit from exercise. And the neurotrophin that I mentioned before, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, in addition to other neurotrophins like insulin-like growth factor one, help to support the growth and connections between neurons. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor levels go up after exercise, and that includes aerobic training and resistance training. So let's put all of this together. As I've described, using your muscles, uh, getting up, lifting weights, doing resistance training, doing aerobic conditioning. These are things that are correlated with better brain health. And the key pathways that are involved here appear to be the immune, specifically the anti-inflammatory effects, the metabolic effects on our bodies that translate into what's happening in our brains. And then these neurotrophic or neuroplastic benefits that are gained by the production of molecules like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So what do you do with all of this information? I think, I hope that I have convinced you that you need to be caring for your muscles if you're interested in caring for your brain. This is a large conversation. Many people have opinions about the best ways to increase muscle uh, gain, the best ways to increase me metabolic health. I wanna go over just a couple of major bullets. And so the first one I would say is, we need to be prioritizing weight training or resistance training when we're thinking about brain health. We have thought about aerobic conditioning, going for a run, for example, as good for our heart health. It's also good for our brain health, but lifting weights is not an inferior form of exercise. And in fact, because of many of these pathways that I've just described, lifting weights may actually be an amazing way to enhance our overall brain health. We see people who lift weights tend to have better brain health, but there may be very specific reasons why doing more resistance training through some of these pathways I've just described is key to a brain health routine. As it relates to how to do this, if you haven't lifted weights before, it's probably a good idea to work with a trainer to familiarize yourself with the equipment. You can start with body weight exercises. You don't need to be in the gym doing really heavy lifting. It is notable though, that if our goal is to activate as much muscle as we can, 
lower body exercises, leg exercises are going to activate a whole lot more muscle than doing something like an isolated biceps curl. So squats and deadlifts, again, not necessarily something I would recommend for somebody who has not been in the gym and is not familiar with the equipment, but they are great ways to activate your largest muscle groups. I'm also a big fan of resistance bands. Uh, resistance bands can be a wonderful way to activate your muscles, especially if you're traveling and don't have access to the gym. And they're a very easy way to get started if you haven't done these types of exercises before. The second thing to consider is aerobic exercise. So these are the typical things like running, swimming, jogging. Uh, I guess jogging is also the same as running, but uh, basically anything that gets your heart rate up. These are things that have been substantially correlated with better brain health, can increase BDNF. These are good things for everybody, and they activate muscles. In addition to the skeletal muscles, which I've described, they're also going to improve uh, the health of your cardiovascular system, which improves blood flow to your brain. They will also improve some of the um, cardiac muscles that I've already described as one of the three major muscle groups. So you're getting a lot of benefit here when you do aerobic conditioning. In addition to, I would say this is key, it's not necessarily a one or the other. I think a perfect exercise routine, especially one that supports the brain, uses aerobic conditioning and resistance training. The next thing I'll mention here is protein. Now, this is a contentious issue. I've heard everything from don't eat protein to eat an incredible and unsustainable amount of protein. We do need adequate protein to support our health. And the general consensus is that we need somewhere around uh, 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight for the average adult per day. With this said, there is some data suggesting that if you're trying to build muscle, if you're trying to improve your metabolic health, if you're an active person, and if you are older than around age 60, that you should consider increasing your daily protein intake to between 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram. Now, obviously, that is a big jump. This is the type of thing that you should talk with somebody, a nutritionist, your doctor about, because so often we hear these things online and we make these changes without exactly knowing what we're doing. You're obviously hearing this online from me right now, but my recommendation would be to consider talking with some sort of a nutrition expert to help you tailor your protein goals to your general goals as far as what you're trying to do. The last thing I'll say here is there's tons of uh, conversation around supplementation with various nutrients in order to support muscle function. I'm not going to get into all the specifics. There are tons of supplements on the market, but the one supplement that I consistently take as it relates to muscle health and to brain health uh, is going to be creatine monohydrate. And creatine monohydrate is one form of creatine. Creatine has been studied now in a number of different studies and review papers to be linked with both better aerobic, or I should say muscular health, and with better brain health. So the research that I've seen suggests that taking between three to five grams of creatine monohydrate each day is a good way to support the muscle brain connection. But as was the case when I talked about protein intake, this is a good thing to work with somebody around, to talk with your health provider, to talk with a nutritionist about, a nutritionist about because these are things that you really want to be building into a comprehensive routine, not just doing a one-off and taking creatine for a few days and thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't see massive muscle gains. So to put all of this together, the bottom line is that muscles speak to your brain, that having better muscular health is a great way to enhance better brain health, and that there are a number of steps that we can take each day to support a muscle to brain connection. Some of the best things you can do right now are to prioritize exercises that target your large muscle groups. Specifically, we're talking about not skipping leg day to make sure you're getting adequate protein intake and then to get supplemental creatine monohydrate if that is a supplement that you would consider because it has actually been studied to correlate with better brain health and better muscular health. Again, highly recommend that you speak with a health practitioner before putting any of these changes into practice, especially as it relates to supplementation and protein intake. And general disclaimer is that you should always speak with your health practitioner. Uh, this is not intended to be medical advice. If you've made it this far, I so appreciate it. Consider subscribing and I look forward to seeing you on the next video.